stand clear. 100% Wild Podcast. So for all you listeners, hello and welcome to Definitely Not Your Favorite Outdoor Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Dury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. This is episode number 333. We are powered by DeerCast, and I am joined by Mr. Matt Drury. And I'm joined by Tim Chelsvik, and we have kind of a special breaking news version. People know us as newsmen. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) We're big newsmen. Just don't put question marks in the teleprompter. (laughs) Yeah, I'm Ron Burgundy. (laughs) We, we've got Tommy Nass with us. So Dr. Tommy Nass is the president of the National Archery in Schools program. And we've talked about Nass Tom, in the past. Tommy Floyd. I'm sorry. Can we, <laughs> what did I say? Tommy Nass. <laughs> oh. I mean, this guy is synonymous with it. <laughs> His identity has become NASP. Tom, <laughs> Dr. Tommy Floyd with us from NASP. I wondered why you were looking at me like shocked and dismayed. <laughs> I was just, I just, I just it right. is Monday morning. I will give Tim a flyer on this. We're, <laughs> well, all of us are running a little bit slower today, but I know that a lot of people have had NASP on the mind because of what's happening right now in our nation's capital as it relates to school funding and some pretty draconian cuts that are on the chopping block for important programs like NASP. So before we get too far into that, Let's, Tommy, introduce yourself a little bit and talk about NASP and what you guys do and then maybe why you've been such a popular guy over the past yeah, couple of weeks. Yeah, I want to get into that 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act and then how it's been kind of hijacked here uh, from the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. So give us a rundown and then we'll dive into that. Well, first of all, thanks for even the opportunity. You, you know that I and NASP are very fond of both of you and your organization and what you do for so many out there. Um, personally, I, I love to check my deer cast. And uh, uh, this, you know, this past weekend, it was, it was fun to be outside in the humidity of Kentucky yes. about the preparation for fall. But back to your original point, I'm here today to talk about the National Archery and Schools Program. We're the largest youth archery program in the world. We currently have 1.3 million students involved in just under 9,000 schools. We've been around since 2002. We're a 501c3. We've had 21 million kids experience a safe experience in in in-school archery. We've trained 104,000 volunteer basic archery instructors to teach that safely. As a matter of fact, talking about safety, which I think safety is going to figure into our discussion today, we have an unblemished safety record in that 21 years. Mm. So 49 states, of eight Canadian provinces. To say that we love what we do is probably the understatement of anything I'll say today. Um, when I when I go to meet my maker, they're gonna talk about my love for him and my love for my family. But let me be clear, I love to see what the shooting sports archery specifically in my case does for kids, kids of all ages, sizes, colors, creeds, and locations. It's just, it's just fun, and it leads to so many positive things for kids and families. We have grown twelve to 1,300 schools in the last several years. The pandemic kind of did to us what it did to so many mm-hmm. youth organizations, but since the pandemic has ended, we have just experienced an unbelievable growth. We added two states. We added Vermont and Rhode Island. Maryland DNR took it back over. Wyoming DNR took it back over. Our future is extremely bright. And I was actually attending some meetings in the early spring when we learned of, of what was going on that, that you guys asked about, about discussing. So that brings us up to the current, uh, probably our awareness and everything started in May of this year. So, so let's jump in right here. So uh, what you're talking about, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, there in 2022, and, and there's two articles right now in DeerCast, one by uh, an update by Jim Richmond, but the original article was by... I think Will Bowen did that one. Okay. And I was thinking it was Taylor maybe, but I could be wrong Could there. be. Okay. So uh, they there was a Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that was passed in 2022, and that was kind of um, uh, related to the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, right? They just want to some restrictions, put some restrictions and try to make 
the world a safer place, the country a safer place. So, so since then, it has kind of filtered down and had a an effect into it's not just NASP. It would be, you know, there's like clay shooting, you know, the shooting sports that schools have trap teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, hunter education programs that schools, you know, in some of these more rural communities mm -hmm. have hunter education programs. So it affects a, uh, several prongs here of what we all love to do. Right. And what smaller communities um, really, it's the, the lifeblood of smaller communities. But it goes beyond that, because what you're talking about with NASP, you guys, like you said, it's all creeds and colors and locations. It goes well beyond just rural communities. Right. Right. So take us through what exactly pass or what what because it did pass, right? The well, it so did, the uh, so the bipartisan yeah. Safer Communities Act passed, mm -hmm. but then the Department of Education took a section of that and they kind of interpreted it for themselves, right? Yes, yeah. Right. And, and that first article was by Taylor Johnson. By okay, the way. yeah. Credit where credits due. So why don't you take us through that a little bit, um, Tommy, and and kind of your uh, understanding of it? Well, about May this year. I, I had I was aware of the Bipartisan Safe Communities Act. None of us was able to say that we're unaware of the tragic events that happened elsewhere. Prayers for all those people involved. And, um, you know, one of the things that you do when you do what we do is you you focus so much on safety and responsibility and all the attributes. So you kind of carry that around with you all the time. And you you you, you focus on it whenever you get a chance to speak to people, especially if they're if they're thinking about adopting NASP or, or one of the other shooting sports. But about May, I learned through an email that was shared with a number of people that some schools in Alaska had sought guidance on the language uh, of using uh, their Elementary and Secondary Act funds, which is the main bucket of federal funds that go to schools all across our nation. Uh, those funds, uh, were, were, the request was, you know, where are we on the use of those for something that we're really uh, growing in in Alaska? And that's NASP. NASP was specifically mentioned in the request. Well, because we were mentioned uh, on that particular day when that particular email came out that the U.S. Department of Education had provided feedback to that request that, whoa, no, that is not something that, according to the language mm. in the November 22 Bipartisan Safe Communities Act would be allowed because of the phrase dangerous weapons included in the language, that it would not be suitable for ESEA funds to be utilized. So that began what I would say, it, you could imagine, it, it, it rained emails in, at my house for a little bit. Have you seen this was the most common question that I was asked on that May day. And the answer was to each one of them, no, but thank you for sharing. Um, in the course of the next five or six days, uh, I had be NASP has become a, a, a great sponsor of AFWA and the regional events. We've gotten involved with the council for the promotion of hunting and the shooting sports. Um, just we've made some great connections with all these people. So I had lots of experts to ask. And um, at that point, there was not much to, to say other than, oh, my goodness, let's research this further. Probably about a month went by with many conversations until a June date. I had just gotten back from the R3 symposium. And one of the folks uh, in the in the in the in Congress asked if I would simply provide, you know, what is NASP and, and what does NASP do for kids? And we we provided two truckloads and a cart full of information to them, and they then worked that information into a letter that went to the secretary, Secretary Cardona of the United States Department of Ed, uh, asking them to rethink the guidance they had given, because according to the senators who were a part of the process, it was never an intent to ill affect the, the millions that are involved in the shooting sports across the country. Um, it was absolutely intended to work together across the aisle to find a way to set apart instructions and vehicles to help schools be safer and communities be safer. But because the language might not have been so tight there or it wasn't inclusive of specifics, then the interpretation was on 
and possible that no, it wasn't intended for it to be used. So that letter went forward and that led us to probably the next 30 days, 25 days. Uh, I, I've been able to talk to several of the staffers of the folks and, and give feedback to them about what our program really does. It also affected hunter education. It also affected like the 4-H shooting sports and all the things that could fall under that uh, envelope of dangerous weapons was interpreted that ESCA funds should not be used for that. Mm. And specifically the line that we're talking about, the BSEA included an amendment to the ESEA that prohibits taxpayer funds from being used for quote unquote training in the use of dangerous weapon. So, I mean, that's a, like you said, that's a really loose term and a lot of things can be wrapped up into it. Unfortunately, a lot of good programs can potentially be wrapped up into it. So since this came out and, you know, I know that you've been on kind of the circuit and, you know, for the Fox news and all the, you know, all the mainstream stuff and reporters are, are reaching out to you. Has there been an update? Because I know on DeerCast we had another article from Jim Richmond, and I know personally I received a text message from a friend in the industry that um, whose spouse works with Senator Josh Hawley and, and sent the DeerCast article on the Facebook um, uh, post about it with all the comments from the user at home, right? The 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 consumer, if you yeah. will, and it wasn't great, right? So I know that they went, you know, they're talking about this stuff there, but. What's the you probably have the most insider information. What what's going to happen here going forward? Because right now there's a firestorm of people just thinking, hey, here's another, you know, the left's trying to take away something else. And it you know, and I'm curious if it's really the case or if it was just a pure misinterpretation of a very loose guideline here in this amendment. Well, let me just say this. I, I I've had a few positions of authority in, in the school business and student safety is, is unbelievably important to every person in our country that does this. I could only imagine how important it is someone at the federal level who by making a decision immediately affects millions of people they might maybe never meet. Um, I know the intent was to be responsive to something as awful as school shootings and, and I'm respectful and, and, and very appreciative for anybody that tries to do that. And I certainly am not critical and I'm not trying to be anything other than honest here about that. But when you think about the amount of pushback that's come from both sides of the aisle that I've read about in the last little bit, I personally have talked to staffers from several congressional offices that have talked about legislation that they were moving forward. And I think now, as you both have indicated, some of those have moved forward to try to address this situation. And, you know, I, and I don't know what kind of time frame we have, but there's just, you know, for the person out there who loves the outdoors, and th this may be a great time just to talk about sometime in this, about just why, if you care about the outdoors, finding a local shooting sports or archery or shotgun or 22 program to help in your community is probably one of the best things you can do to help the future of what you love how to do. And I do believe that the effort is underway to try to find a solution to this interpretation. And I, I don't mean to sound corny, but fellas, we're America. This is what we do. If we, if we, if we hit a, if we hit head on on something, we find a place where we can work out a common solution to obviously circumvent a, an unexpected negative or an unintended negative. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to hold on to this being an unintended negative. I don't know, but, but I've got to think it was an unintended negative, uh, maybe a co not a commission, but an omission here with mm -hmm. the language of the original act. Um, I just know that there's so many people that have contacted us like, hey, we want to do everything we can. And I've read already many of the uh, sportsmen's groups out there have provided vehicles for their uh, membership to make contact with their, their folks in Congress to let them know. And, and you know, most of the time we're all too busy to do something like that. And we think we're going to make some list if we do that. That is exactly what freedom is all about. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hopefully teach kids that um, here's my opinion. But if your opinion's different, I respect it. But let me tell you why I think my opinion's right. Well, one of the most important things we can do is let people know, hey, this is this is currently on the books. 
And, and this is something we'd like for you to think about because maybe you didn't know what it was doing in my community. Mm-hmm. Maybe you didn't know what it was doing for my, my son or my grandson or my granddaughter. But it is doing that for them. And it's for the first time that they've connected with their school. And we need you to hear from us. Yeah. So that, that, that attitude of withholding judgment before you know exactly what was in a person's heart and mind is so important because a lot of times we jump to conclusions sure. and then you put the other side or the other party at, uh, on the defensive and there's just no mm-hmm. there's no way forward so in that in that first article that taylor did on deercast we did provide a link for people to click on and you mm-hmm. can very easily find out who your senators and representatives are so you can make contact because yep. it is important for them to hear from us and, and 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 what we think what type of funding like how much funding are we talking about because you guys also i mean part of what you do right is is raising funds for these programs because i'm sure that the the federal government isn't paying for the entire program right you're also raising funds a lot of funds probably the majority of it to make this work in in all these locations uh just 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 so uh school funding is different in every every state sure but there are local funds that are raised property valuation funds and so on. There are state funds that are provided by the state legislators and and the legislatures through their uh, existing laws. And then there's the federal funds, which are, which are, when I was a school superintendent, I received, of course, all three and all three were important. And you work, you work for, for months to create a draft budget that you put before your board and you try to get all the I's dotted and the T's crossed so that, you're using the local, state, and federal monies available to you so you can have buses, books, beans, and buildings, besides great quality staff members to educate kids. So as it's going to differ in every state, states may use in one state, they may use federal funds for something where another state would cover that pot completely with state or local funds, gotcha. mostly local funds when it comes to that. And I forgot activity funds, which are all the things that generate reg- re- uh generate revenue locally like athletics and mm-hmm. band but but it, it it's all a hodgepodge of funding that finds its way into a school board budget the big concern for us i guess along with anyone else that has a school linked activity is um it's kind of like you know may i proceed mm. till I, until i'm comfortable that i may proceed what am i going to do well if i'm not wanting to get, end up with in the newspaper or with a problem with my state I'm going to check my local attorney. I'm going to talk to my board attorney. I'm going to talk to my superintendent association. I'm going to talk to the principals in my school district. I'm going to do, I'm going to get a lot of second opinions before I proceed. So the danger here is not so much that it's a, a hammer or an anvil. No, no, no. It's a, I'm not sure. And I better make sure I seek some guidance. And we all know what happens when I'm not sure I'm going to kind of put a comma at the end of that sentence. And for, for us, we were concerned that the comma would, if it wasn't dealt with, would lead to a period at the end of the sentence. To my knowledge today, no one has said we're not going to do NASP. Mm-hmm. Good. 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 I do have some states, you know, I, I, we're in 49, as I said, so coordinators have reached out to us. We have put something out that the seri- that the situation is fluid and we're waiting to hear back. Uh, we're, we're one of the many fish waiting to see how the level of the lake rises mm-hmm. and falls, just like everybody mm-hmm. else. And so I think it's important to do what you've already said, communicate with the people who are in the decision making process, not to be accusatory or negative, but to say, hey, just so you know, let me tell you what's going on in my community. And I know those people that are elected to do that need to hear from people that are so proud of what is going on for young people Mm -hmm. in the outdoors or the shooting sports. Well, heck, if you want to get down to it, my my high school had shop class and industrial arts and they're like everything in there is a, is a potentially a weapon <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> you know, everything in there can hurt and maim people uh depending on the and, and you said that you it's all about intent <laughs> exactly exactly you said that 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 nasp has been running programs 21 million some children have had experience healthy safe experiences and right. no one has been harmed yes yeah i think beyond that i think it's really important to say this about the safety you know, we have not had a safety issue while the kids were engaged using our safety protocols. But I think anybody out there who does something with kids, with archery or any other shooting sport, there's another caveat we have to talk about. And that is, one, what they learn while they're handling a bow, mm-hmm. an arrow, 
a shotgun, a 22. They learn responsibility. They learn, they learn that there is only on or off when it comes to safety. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the mechanical the device because it can fail because that's what it says in the hunter safety book. But I'm talking about the awareness that what I'm doing right now is essentially I am responsible for me and it could affect others. But from that, it goes so much further. Team membership, per, uh, personally connecting with a group of people that I may not have been connected with before, representing my school. And then we can get into the thousands of life lessons that these coaches and all these different disciplines across America teach kids mm -hmm. in these communities that are on the trap team, they're on the archery team, they're on the 22 air rifle, whatever team. Yes, they teach them to shoot accurately. They teach them to shoot safely, but they teach them to be better people. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that, that's a hundred percent what we need. You think about a kid who's had experience with a, a positive, healthy experience with a weapon and now understands the power behind it, how much less likely they are to do something that is violent or countercultural. Well, beyond that, I think about just like on a local level, I think about my little community that I live in the NAS program. When I look and Cameron's still, my son's still a couple years away from being eligible to, to participate, but I, I know several people from just our neighborhood in general and the area that are participating in it. And when I look at it, there's only like a, a handful that have a predisposition towards it, like hunting, you know, their dads are hunters or whatever, but the majority of them have nothing to do with the outdoors. And so it's a gateway into this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, you know, when you're talking about these type of programs, I think about even like the school of the wild is a program that in the state of Iowa that, um, that we're trying to help maybe grow past Iowa and some, some of the other States, but they're giving these kids opportunities to see nature, see the outdoors. And a lot of them really have, I mean, it's like, Hey, let's get away from the screen and, mm -hmm. and do something that, you know, although NASP, it's an inside deal. I mean, it, it's a gateway to an outside deal. Mm -hmm. and, right. and that's what I think is so important. So it goes beyond this, you know, training and the use of dangerous weapons. Your, your point and you're training these, to, you're training these kids to, to become um, men and women at some point that understand and know the use of what a weapon yeah, means, important. you know, and that's important. So, and it's a gateway into so many other things, positive things. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can continue to help spread the message here and um, everybody reaches out to their um, elected officials to help <laughs> control the, the wildfire that's been spreading here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that your point there about the kid that didn't involve two thirds, 66% of the kids that discover NASP have never been in archery before. We require an in-school component of at least 10 hours of instruction. Again, 21 years of in-school archery instruction, no issues. Two thirds of the kids never having been exposed to archery, a decent percentage of those kids then turn on sister, brother, mama, daddy. They end up shooting the bow in the backyard. That's called family time. Yeah. And it's called, maybe we'll check out the next step, which is Maybe we'll go down and, and we'll look at a 3D range, or maybe we'll try target archery in our community, or maybe we'll go bow hunting. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe all of these things lead us to the outdoors. And, you know, this, the, the, the pandemic was extremely difficult for kids. Isolation, no social interaction. As soon as they could start gathering again and practicing, NASP exploded. And it's been exploding since the pandemic ended. And I'm hopeful that we get past this so that the growth doesn't uh, become, you know, repressed. And I just know the good things happening in big communities, small communities, because so many new excited families are, they can't wait to tell you because they're, they're going somewhere this weekend to shoot mm -hmm. archery at such and such school. <laughs> Well, hopefully this is just another like rocket booster that pushes NASP into more communities and just draws the awareness of how important supporting it is and the fact that it exists and, uh, and is doing such great work. Well, we, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about it anytime. And we do appreciate what Drury Outdoors has been in our communications with you guys now for over two years. So we, we know that your interest is in what's good for kids and and, and that's why that I, I love you both enough to be here on a Monday morning. And talk about <laughs> well, we appreciate it. The The work you guys are doing is um, it's very important and it's not just important from a 
you know, the hunting side of things where we, where our line, lane is, is primarily focused. It's important because of the things you just said and, and how it creates, um, uh, probably a, a change of direction for some of these kids in general. And we need that more than ever. So thank you. Yeah. Let's jump into the, we, we're going to do a little bit of our show standards here. If you want to stick around, if you have something more important to do, we get that too. It's up to you if you want to stick around for a few minutes. I'm happy to listen. I'll probably learn a lot. I don't know about that. <laughs> Let's skip the real wild club. Let's jump into the wildlife word. Maybe we will we'll learn something. Okay. Here. It's brought to you by PH Outdoors. Get your fall food plots in with a dependable PH Outdoors implement. Before we go further, I want to say, so PH Outdoors, it's a, it's an off all of RTP outdoors. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a new take on the, the old Genesis drill. It's now the G five, the G eight, Paul Hollis, who was the, he was instrumental in Mastermind. RTP. Yeah. He kind of shifted and broke off and he's doing his own, own thing now. So um, it's, I want to kind of just throw that out there because I don't know that many people know about that just yet. It's pretty new and uh, we're excited to, to help them out and, and spread the word here. Do you think PH Outdoors stands for Paul Hollis Outdoors? You know, now that you say that. Hmm. <laughs> All right. So what do we got this week? <clears throat> True horns differ from antlers because A, they're covered in keratin and don't shed. B, horns have a chewy caramel center. Mm. C, they're attached to the animal's skull, or D, horns are flammable and often catch on fire. Well, I know in certain circles, horns, if you say horns, when you're talking about deer antlers, people get really mad. Well, actually. Yeah, yeah. so I, I kind of think um, it'd go with C, right? They're attached to the animal's skull. Am I correct? Tommy, what do you... Uh... What do you think, brother? Well, I was always the guy trying to talk about the difference between a horn and antler. So <laughs> in, in biology class, and, and it was always to, you know, what I explained at the time was, yeah, it has a, it has a, it has a nice thick protein coat on the outside, but it also doesn't come off. Yeah. And it's amazing to me that certain ungulates do lose their antlers and that they can grow them back each year. Uh, a lot of the ones around me don't seem to grow them back as large <laughs> as the Dr. Tommy Floyd in the house, wildlife biologist extraordinaire here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Impressive. So I, I'm guessing your answer is A with a major flex. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Could it also be C? <laughs> no. Well, this is the difference. So this is it's it's an oddly worded question, but yeah, it's like thanks, what, Tim. what is the difference between them? They're uh, they're actually both attached to the animal's skull. So uh, that would not be the case. But A is the correct answer. They're covered in keratin, uh, which is like the same material that your fingernails are made of. Mm. Toenails. I see. Uh, and they don't shed. They just keep on growing. So what what all would classify under that? Sheep, bighorn sheep, stuff like that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, bull, like cattle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty crazy when you think about an elk or a moose or like just to see how much they grow. It's, I mean, whitetails are one thing. Yes, it's great. But when you think about elk. And the sheer moose, mass yeah, that has caribou, to get put on. Yeah, pretty crazy. Golly. So. Well, and, and, and also I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, an extension here. I think bird beaks are also kind of the same way because like that that euro turkey skull i did that's on the that's on the tin wall over there when i boiled that the sheath like the beak comes off there's bone underneath but kind of the dark colored part of the beak and that hook actually comes off and it, it also is like a keratin material like a horn material look at you did you know birds have horns <laughs> You want to start an argument? <laughs> go go online with that. <laughs> Turkey horns. Okay. How about let's uh, do a shout out here. We got a shout out from the Rack Pack. Stephen Christian says when Mark or Terry are on, provide some actual useful information. That's what he loves about the show. Just kidding. I enjoy Matt and Tim's adventures as well. So is he saying that we need Mark Arterion for him to enjoy the show? Uh, pretty much everyone says that. <laughs> ah, well. He's just calling it out. This was his, part of his uh, his questionnaire answer into the Rack Pack. Lucky for him, this is a deep tease. Uh -oh. We may have both Mark and Terry what? on together in the Impossible. next episode in Impossible. studio. 
It is. It's. It never happens, so it is almost impossible. <laughs> Red letter day for us. That's right. All right. Last but certainly not least, we're going to welcome some new Rack Pack members. The Rack Pack's a private Facebook group. You can uh, join. Just go over to Facebook, hit the search button. I think Drury Outdoors Rack Pack or 100% Wild Rack Pack. It'll come up. Yeah. Wade Robinson is now a member. Boy, that really stirred up the hornet's (laughs) nest. (laughs) So uh, every week I read some names that Tim put together. Every, Every week there's a fake name. Every week I butcher almost everybody's name. So let's see what we got this week. We got Leighton Welsh, John Stevens. Owen Rebling, Rebling, mm-hmm. Zach Pritchett, Obi Sosh, Obi Sosh, Obi. Brian Gutsky, Gutsky, Hopkins, Randy, wait, <laughs> 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 Stephen Christian, <laughs> Fletch Ingjig, Fletching Gig, Fletch, Fletching Jig, got it, fake name, bam. Took me a minute. <laughs> what I, I think is funny is now the Rack Packers are like sounding out <laughs> people's names when you put the new n- names in the Rack Pack. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, and one guy was like, I'm a real person. <laughs> I'm actual. <laughs> so, all right. Welcome, everybody. Yeah. Glad to have you guys. We are just a few members away from 2000. All right. We're sh- like 1,994. Tommy, are you in the Rack Pack yet? No, but it looks like it's my daily assignment. Okay, so we're up to 1,995. Here we go. Tommy's the drop that brings the waterfall. Here we go. Well, he's so good at recruitment, so yeah, no maybe kidding. we'll get over 2,000. I know hope you do. It's a great way to spend your time. Oh, okay. it's a waste of time. Well, Tommy, keep us updated as things go forward and let us know whatever we can do to help NASP out and, uh, and the work that you guys are doing. We're happy to do it. Well, thank you so very much for, for having me today. You, you guys are fantastic, and you're the same away from this on the telephone or whenever we've talked. And I'm very grateful for what Drury Outdoors does. I'm grateful that uh, you're interested in our students, uh, and we certainly hope we will get past this and have some continued great days ahead. So God bless both of you, and thank you. No, thank you. I still believe the good and people are out, you know, it's out there. So I have a feeling this is going to turn the tide here. And and honestly, it may be a a new windfall of new recruitment, too, because it sure has uh, helped publicize what you guys, the great work you guys are doing. Okay. well, thank you all. God bless you. All right. Thanks, Tommy. All right. That'll be another uh, episode in the books. That was a good one. Tommy's the man doing great stuff. Great organization. And uh, we'll keep people posted on what's yeah, going on and, here. And, and, and a couple of things that we should we should remind folks of: we are still giving a new tracker off road unit away. Oh, and Deercast, yeah. yeah, we never talk about it. We really should. But if you go to Deercast, if you haven't already, make sure to register. Just go to Deercast, hit the nav in the, in the nav bar button. There's a giveaway button. Hit that and register. Make sure that you're in there for that. And, and yes, we do give them away each year. Yes. <laughs> it's a real thing. <laughs> Although I would love to do a fake contest sometime. <laughs> well, I think we'd be in trouble. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, that's it for this week. All right. Until Stay next tuned time. next week. It's going to be a big shoot. Mark and Terry, the goats. Here we go. All right. Till next time. Peace out. DeerCast is now supercharged with maps. Get ahead of your game with killer new features like live Doppler radar, wind check out to five days, virtual rain gauges, GPS path tracking, and more. Plus, get our 14-day revolutionary DeerCast prediction and access to DeerCast track. Prep, predict, and pursue with DeerCast. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This episode of DOD TV is brought to you by DeerCast. Prep, predict, and pursue your target buck.